Uh, so next is Hector Navarro on geosynchronous orbits. Go ahead, Hector. Hi, um, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very exciting meeting. I'm having a lot of fun um, in this meeting and listening to uh, these discussions and talks uh, like David's. Um, and um, I would like to, uh, let me share my screen here. Um, I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm going to talk about the very uh, specific techno signature. So uh, we're going to, um, th this, this talk is going to be a little, a little bit more narrow minded than, uh, than David's. So um, sorry about that, but this is a techno signature that I'm really excited about. And uh, I wanted to, to tell you a, a few things about it and, and hopefully see if I can convince you to share my, uh, my excitement. And um, so what I, what I think is that the um, potentially um, alien uh, artifacts, satellites, uh, particularly in geostationary and geosynchronous orbits are a very, very interesting techno signature um, for mainly for a couple of reasons. First, I think it's a very, very, um, um, or at least a, a reasonably plausible um, techno signature. It's something that we are doing. Uh, we're doing um, on a daily basis. We're populating our space environment with satellites, and particularly, we're putting more and more um, geostationary and geosynchronous satellites. So we are doing it, and um, actually, if we continue the current trend from the past 20 or 30 years, just extrapolate what, we are, what we've been doing for decades, um, you end up with the conclusion that our uh, geostationary belt, our Clark belt, will be detectable in about 200 years um, with current technology. So that's the first thing. It's something, it, it's a very natural extrapolation. It's a very, it's a very small extrapolation of our current human technology and it doesn't require any uh, new advanced technology. It, it only requires technology that we know exists and just continue doing things that, that we are doing in a natural way. The other thing that I believe it's important is that this techno signature is what I call uh, OCAM friendly. And what I mean by this is that, you know, in SETI we have this problem that when you find something new, you have to sort of rule out all other simpler explanations. And that's very difficult to do, but if you find uh, objects that are in geosynchronous orbit, then nature does not do that, does not have a preference for geosynchronous orbit. So the simpler explanation would be that it's artificial. And then it's free to search for, uh, for these uh, belts of satellites because you can try to find them in um, transit observations like the ones we are doing for exoplanet observations. And we know this is a big priority for astronomy. So there's a lot of effort in analyzing these transits. So, these are all good things. The question is, can um, an exoplanet grow such a thick population of satellites that they will be detectable? And by the way, when I say satellites, we could be talking about other things. We could be talking about factories in orbit or cities in orbit, whatever. But let's think about satellites to, to keep it simple. And so the number to bear in mind is about 10 to the minus three in terms of um, opacity of this belt. And the more I've been thinking about this problem, the more I've convinced myself that the key point here is what we call the graveyard. The graveyard is a space that we have around the Clark belt where we push our satellites after uh, when we decommission satellites, we just give them a nudge and push them to this orbit, which is basically about 300 kilometers um, above the, the geosynchronous orbit. Uh, but this is a very thin layer uh, compared to the geosynchronous um, altitude. So it's basically, it's part of the techno signature itself. The graveyard is part of the techno signature. And so the big question here is the lifetime. How long can such a techno signature survive? And that's what I've been trying to work on, uh, trying to understand. And it turns out that there's not, at least I haven't been able to find in the literature studies about the long-term survival of, um, geosynchronous and geostationary satellites. Um, there seems to be this, uh, you, you find it mentioned in papers that um, they will be potentially for millions of years, but I haven't seen the actual calculation. Maybe uh, the space agencies have internal documents where they've calculated this, but this is not a very interesting problem for, 
for space uh, space agencies and, and and companies that that build satellites because they're mostly interested in the short term behavior the fine perturbations that these satellites uh, undergo and that require the station keeping um, you know on scales of years or decades these these are the perturbations that have been analyzed so um, i've i've made my own uh, simulations about this um, because the long-term stability is limited by these factors that you can see here. And I've, I've been doing my own simulations. I use my own code, which um, it's actually a, an N-body Newtonian uh, simulation code that I use for a, another paper that I published in 2018. So this is a code that has been um, scrutinized. It's publicly available in GitHub and it's been, it's been subject to scrutiny. So it's, um, I think it's uh, reliable. And I've done these simulations um, I don't have time to go into the details, but if anybody's inter interested, I'll be happy to, to share the details. And um, I've been able to run these simulations for basically uh, a million years. And uh, in this simulation, I've included the gravitational influence of the sun and the moon, the perturbations from sun and moon. Um, in the future, I also want to include uh, planets, uh, Jupiter uh, mainly. And, um, and also solar radiation pressure. Uh, I've also taken it into account. And well, just, uh, just to give you the, the result is that these orbits are stable on scales of millions of years, okay? Uh, for as long as, as I've been able to run these simulations, the objects have remained there. Now, my definition of stability here, it doesn't mean that the orbit is not perturbed. We know that these orbits change over the course of uh, the years. They, um, they, have, uh, they undergo precession, and there's also an oscillation in the inclination of about plus minus um, 10 degrees. But uh, what I'm interested in is to determine whether these objects will remain in orbit, um, whether they will remain in the, in the Clark belt. Um, they will not be deorbited or um, ejected on scales of a million years. So that's, that's the, the result I was interested in. And of course, the other important point has to do with collisions. Uh, that's the other limiting factor because we need a really um, large population of satellites. Remember, when you look through it, uh, you, you must have an opacity of about 10 to the minus three. So that means one in a thousand photons will be blocked by this, um, by these objects. And so it's important to understand how collisions um, limit the lifetime of this, uh, of this structure. What's interesting is that, um, I mean, you could argue, I mean, we, or I guess you could bring up the argument that maybe an advanced civilization will be more careful with their space environment than we are. And then they will not allow their Clark uh, belt to become so crowded as to um, to uh, compromise the operations of their satellites. Um, I, I don't know. We don't seem to be doing a very good job in that respect, but maybe the, uh, the aliens are smarter than us or more careful. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's a discussion we can have. But the reason why I believe the graveyard is so interesting is because you don't have that. Um, that that's not an issue for the graveyard. This is just a place where you dump your uh, your dead satellites out there. That's the easiest place to, to put them. And you don't have a, a problem if they start colliding with each other. Um, the, the collisions um, have been simulated by, because this, this is a very interesting problem. And so there are many simulations about the collisions uh, of satellites in various orbits. And what you find is that in, um, in geostationary orbit, what happens is that you get, uh, when two satellites collide, you get a debris spread over the, the entire belt in longitude and latitude, but you don't get a lot of spread in the radial direction. Um, in fact, they, they don't even consider it. So collisions are actually interesting. They, they help us because when, when two satellites collide, what happens is that internal parts that were hidden in the satellite all of a sudden become exposed. And, and so they contribute to the techno signature. They contribute to create uh, opacity to make the belt thicker. So at least initially collisions actually help you uh, because they, they increase the population of your belt with many smaller items. Okay, so, so they're bad for, for the space environment, 
but in the graveyard, you, you don't really care about. And remember, we're talking about about 10 to the minus three here. So, you know, it, you can't even see it from the, from the surface of the planet. It, it's even less worrisome for the aliens that Starlink is for us, for instance. Uh, and it only covers a strip on the sky because this is a belt, right? So in principle, the aliens probably don't have a problem with um, their satellites uh, colliding in the, in the graveyard. Um, so when you run the numbers, it turns out that for a complete, mm, for, for a significant fraction of the satellites to undergo collisions, uh, the amount of time it takes is of the order of mega year, okay? And this depends on the details of the simulation. It depends very strongly with the, um, of the, the thickness of this graveyard. I'm considering 300 kilometers, just like we have. But if you have a, a, a bigger graveyard, then um, the lifetime of the belt scales uh, with the power uh, to the three, right, of this, of this thickness. So it has a very strong influence. So if you just increase the thickness of your belt, you can increase the lifetime a lot. And it decreases with the size of the, of the objects. So smaller objects will, um, will, um, will have a belt of smaller objects will have a longer lifetime, okay? So I think it's fair to say under very conservative um, assumptions that um, collisions are not a problem at mega year time scales. So my conclusion is that uh, at least on mega year scales, um, a, a Clark belt is sufficiently stable. Um, I was planning to conclude my presentation with some, uh, um, by uh, teasing you with an intriguing idea, which is that due to the Earth's aspherosity, there are two special longitudes where, that are stable. So if anybody had put a probe in geostationary orbit a million years ago to watch our planet, these two longitudes are where those probes will be right now. And one of the locations is, uh, is south of Mexico, it's in the ocean. The other location is south of India. Uh, but interestingly, you have the Maldive Islands here, very close to that spot. So I was hoping that maybe we could uh, uh, try to get funds for an expedition there to, to try to run a search for artifacts. But then Jim Benford told us yesterday that, um, that all the sizable objects on geostationary orbit are already well known. So that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Maybe we can still try to do the expedition and, and look just in case. Um, it sounds like a fun place to be. But anyway, so I'll, I'll just leave you with the conclusions of this, uh, of this presentation. I just wanted to bring up the point that I think the geostationary artifacts are extremely interesting uh, because it's a very plausible techno signature. It's, it's something that I believe it's, is reasonably um, likely to happen. Um, it's outcome friendly. That's also a very important point. It's possibly long lived in the scales of mega years, maybe more um, depending on, on the details of the collisions and it's free to search for. So I think this is a, this is a very, a very interesting techno signature. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions if you have them.